Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Theological Leftovers. I have been using the Treasury of Daily Prayer for my devotions, and that has been taking us through uh, Jeremiah, um, and uh, hadn't hadn't looked uh, quite so closely at Jeremiah in a little while, and am learning all kinds of interesting things or being reminded of them. Um, I, one thing I want to share with you today um, is... I, I, I do remember, and I absolutely love, it's one of my favorite passages. I'm going to share that with you in a moment. Um, that's from Jeremiah 31. Uh, it's verse 26. But but Jeremiah 23 caught my attention. I'm not quite ready to speak on this. Um, I haven't had time to dive in a little bit deeper. But I want to invite you to look at it, maybe be thinking about it yourselves. Um, Jeremiah 23 has this phrase that keeps getting used over and over again which is burden of the Lord, the burden of the Lord. Um, And it it gets used quite frequently towards the end of Jeremiah 23, and so much so that it doesn't at first even hardly make sense to me, and I'm guessing it won't to you either. Um, Why does he keep saying this um, in quotes as a phrase? Um, In fact, the people are kind of being condemned because they keep talking about the burden of the Lord, the burden of the Lord. Um, and there was a note that said that the Hebrew for burden, and I haven't even looked it up yet, but the, the Hebrew for that is is oracle, for burden, is oracle. In other words, the word of the Lord. This is reference to a word of judgment, um, which I could see a word of judgment being a burden. But it's really got me thinking, especially because right after I read this devotion, I use uh, the hymnal and... Um, in the evening, um, one of the phrases in my devotion has to do with Jesus saying, come unto me and I'll give you rest. And he says, my burden, he talks about his burden twice in that passage, and one he talks about his burden being light. Um, so anyway, it's got me really interested in that, in maybe doing a bit of a, a word study and looking around a little bit at, at uh, this whole idea of a burden, and especially the burden of the Lord. If you, uh, this is something you've already heard about or you've already studied, you know something about it, I'd be interested in in, uh, in what you have learned or what you have heard. Um, I'll take that into account as I take a look at the text myself. Uh, if that was totally boring to you, well, I don't blame you because, you know, I haven't figured anything out yet. Uh, but this I have figured out. Um, it's not hard to figure out, and I love it. It's uh, Jeremiah thirty-one twenty-six, and I'll read it to you in a moment. But the, the background is this. Um, Jeremiah, as you probably know, was uh, one of his nicknames was the weeping prophet, and and appropriately so. Um, I guess this is sort of true of all the prophets, um, but but nobody ever listened to him. He shared the word of the Lord, gave people the opportunity to repent, and nobody did. Instead, they treated him violently, and uh, and completely rejected him. Um, and, and the God that sent him. And uh, what made his situation especially sad was he was the prophet in Jerusalem at the time that Jerusalem was destroyed. And everyone was, over a period of years, carted off into exile. Um, so it, it, in many ways, is a very sad story. He had to share um, words of judgment. I don't want to call them bad news, but he, he had to share words of judgment Um, He suffered for it, nobody listened, and it seemed like it was fruitless. It seemed like it was fruitless because Jerusalem was destroyed. Um, And so in that context, Jeremiah chapter 31 um, is God um, telling Jeremiah about the restoration, about what happens after everything is destroyed, right? Um, And he shares just this beautiful, beautiful picture um, with Jeremiah, um, apparently as he's sleeping. So this is before all the destruction, and God lets him know what's going to happen after all the destruction. So none of it has taken place yet, right? But the destruction is inevitable, and the point is, so is the restoration, right? So Jeremiah has this this vision, this, this dream, And at the end of it, he says in verse 26 of chapter 31, at this I awoke and looked. I like that. I awoke. I awoke. (laughs) I awoke and looked. 
And he says, and my sleep was pleasant to me. And I think that's my favorite passage, maybe in all the scriptures. After so much suffering and what seemed like so much fruitless work, God revealed to him what was going to happen after what was going to happen. And it was enough, right? Jeremiah's rest was pleasant to him because he believed the gospel, right? First of all, because God shared the gospel with him. He showed him the promise of restoration. He showed him what the forgiveness of sins in Christ would do. He showed it all to him. And Jeremiah believed it. And he was able to rest in the gospel, even in the midst of, of uh, a very difficult job that pointed to a very bleak um, near future. He rested in the promises of God. He rested in this wonderful news of the gospel. He believed it. So, as you, uh, our dear brothers and sisters in Christ, who live in these last days um, and see all kinds of trouble all around you, um, I pray that your rest would be pleasant. And I don't just mean your sleep. But they pray that you would, like Jeremiah, be able to rest in the good news of the gospel. In Christ, God has saved the world. He has redeemed you. And Jesus is coming back to make all things new. Rest in this good news, no matter what. God bless you. God bless your week.